Get to know Michael Kilgore. The singer, songwriter, and activist talks about his album, A Man Born Black, and making music with a very important message. All right, I am most excited about my guest today, Mr. Michael Kilgore. Welcome to the show. <laughs> oh, thank you for having me. I'm so hyped to be here with you. <laughs> thank you. All right, well, welcome to the show. Although we are just meeting, let me announce I am a fan of your talent already. <laughs> yeah, now I'm blushing. Just <laughs> <laughs> I was all on iTunes, like, let me find this album. It's so good. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. As a singer, songwriter, and activist, which I love, what inspired your affinity for creating music? Well, for me, I think it is just my way of trying to let people know who I am. Um, I'm one of those, I was one of those kids who was always like, see me, because I'm real short. Um, so I think music was my way of being big and being seen. And I'm now as an adult, I feel like it's my way of trying to giving people a window into the real me. That's fantastic. I love that so much. And you know, your sound is so multifaceted and your range is incredible at your soulful ballads. How do you personally describe the music that you create from its lyricism to melody? Well, first of all, you really know how to woo a brother. You're saying <laughs> all the right things and it sounds so good. Um, but what, um, my, where my sound comes from, hmm. Um, I really think it's like a mixture of all the things that my mom and my grandma and everybody that I grew up with listened to and that input is the output. So um, my album is, is such a love letter to soul music of the 70s, 80s, 90s, there's even some 60s in there where I'm just paying tribute to all these artists who have touched my artistry so intensely and they really have painted the whole landscape of what American music is. I, I want my brand to be reclaiming all this good music. Black people did that in America, so the American sound is black sound. Yes, beautiful sound, black sound, and you could hear the old to the previous generations of music, you know, but then it also has your own flavor in it as well. So I like that you take the old school, create the new new and improved Michael Kilgore. I went way back on your YouTube, way back to 2011. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how your voice is still sounds the same, you know, but I hear like a theater sound in your voice. Did you start in theater? I actually did. Well, I started professionally as a theater artist. I've been on Broadway, multiple shows. I did Hair on Broadway, Motown on Broadway. I've done the first national tour of Book of Mormon. I've done um, lots of things on and off. And um, I, I would say that that theatrical experience has really grown my pen as well as my performance because you know that's a world where you got to rain or shine eight times a week. You got to hit that stage and hit it right. So my goal is to bring that level of excellence to everything that I do. Wow, so to go from theater Broadway to independently producing your own music, now you're in a recording studio. How how has that dynamic changed for you? You know, what do you like about the difference? <laughs> when you learn you can't sing as loud, you gotta kinda shut, shut up a little bit, the room is smaller. Um, also, it is, it's such a different skill. Um, singing in the studio and singing on stage, it is, it's a little nerve wracking because you know that whatever you do is going to be the version that everyone remembers. And I have friends who are like, you sang it different. And I was like, I don't remember what I did in the studio. Like, leave me alone. Um, it's never had your takes. I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, I, but I really love um, the studio because then I get to be a big nerd and I get to say, oh no, do it like this and let's try this and let's play with that and let's get it exactly how we want it. So I'm actually thankful because my team really um, made sure that I wasn't too analytical. Um, my producer, Jamison Ross, who is a spectacular artist in his own right, he actually was one of those people in the studio who would say, all right, Michael, that was it. The feeling is right, let it go. I was like, okay, I trust you, I trust you. So, <laughs> a lot of people, like, hey, are you sure, are you? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but we had to move on, so he was like, ah, you can't go back now, so. Mm -hmm. Well, so that I, level of protection, per, perfection that you have in your music, it, it, it exudes. So, you know, you care about the, the, having the best sound, the 
best take, you know. And um, I really, I really care about the message, and mm -hmm. I care. I think that's the theater in me too. Mm -hmm. I care that the story is clear for everybody listening, and that when you leave it, you're not just going, "Ooh, that sounded great," mm -hmm. or "Oh, I felt that." And when people say things like that to me, it's the highest compliment in the world. Absolutely, I can totally understand that. So t let's talk about your single, Pass Me That Vaporizer. It's a uh, it's, good. it's got a little groove. Which yeah, yeah. that's the first thing that I heard from you, right? So then I go back yeah. and I wanted to listen to your other disc discography, right? And I was like, oh, this, this man is singing like beautiful, soulful ballads that just bring goosebumps to your arm. So, I mean, how was the change? That was a change up for you, right? To do like a Caribbean beat? That was different for you, huh? It was a change up. Well, for me, I think that it was, um, there's this very famous picture of Stevie Wonder and um, Bob Marley together. And to me, this song is like me hearing what that possibly sounded like. Um, I wanted to write something that was a metaphor on, uh, this is, I'm trying to be deep. It was a metaphor for what Michelle Obama said when she said, when they go low, we go high. So I said, okay, we go high, we go high, we go high. And I was like, oh, okay, well, the vaporizer, you know, when they go low, we go high. And as I began to write the song, it kind of took that idea and transformed it into me writing a song that was kind of like a musical self-portrait where I was able to say, this is who I am, this is what I feel, this is what I stand for. And um, that people like it and they groove into it, it just feels crazy to me. I, I didn't realize that it would um, be so, so beloved because I love it so much. You know, it's a creative ode to the essence of beautiful, powerful black man. I'm married to a black man, so I, I'm all for the black man. So the cinematography of the music video, I feel is stunning. What was that experience working with Paul A. Notice the second? Oh my goodness, that I was- your vision to life, I know, didn't he? <laughs> Paul is my friend, so okay. it was to work with a friend. But also, I wanted to, to do this video in a place that was about black, um, peace. It was a place of oasis for black black folks, especially black men. So doing it in a barbershop was incredible. And as a queer black man, it was extra special for me because that was a place that that for a lot of queer folk is a very difficult space. And I said, you know what? This is a space for all of us black folk. And I want to make sure that this video feels like a real harbor for all of us. And and I got that feeling from the moment we stepped into the barbershop to the moment that the video premiered and uh, I am so, so proud of it. So proud. So Penny's Barbershop is here in Chicago where I am, are you mm -hmm. from Chicago? Yes. No, I'm not. My sister is from Chicago. My stepsister is from um, Cicero. Okay. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in Chicago, but to be on the South Side, which I love, I've spent a lot of time in Chicago and um, Broke a lot of hearts in Chicago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I love it there. I, love I it. gotta know. Okay, my favorite part of the video, which I'm pretty sure is a popular part, is how you had the picture frames singing your lyrics. That was like genius to me. So where well, did that idea come from? That was, the, that was the beginning of the video. Like, in my mind, I was like, this is what I want it to be. I want it to be one of those classic barbershop posters. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> And my manager, David Hargret, was like, oh, okay, okay, let's see if we can make that happen. And like he does with almost every one of my ideas, he just pushed until it came to life. Where did this sea of beautiful black men come from? You just cast it? They all look good, yeah. <laughs> I wanted it to be a cornucopia of delicious blackness <laughs> so that everyone has something, you know, it's like when you open up the box of chocolates and it's like, I mean, I like coconut, but I like this one. <laughs> um, so I mean, the lighting and everything, because you know that's a skill to like brown skin. No, I know. That's a real talent. So I was like, everybody's lit well. Like everyone was lit well. <laughs> everyone was. Everyone knew the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, we had a we had a casting, and it ended up just being a whole bunch of friends that were. Wow. Like, and then I was like, man, all my friends look good. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, maybe maybe I'm not so bad. If I'm around, <laughs> they definitely. 
I feel like they might rub off on me a little bit. That is amazing. Okay, well, let's talk about it. So in this social climate of protest against racial discrimination and violence in the community, your album, A Man Born Black, is so timely. A deep and memorable line in your song is, this is our current situation. We're sick and tired of conversation. Why was it important to include that lyric in your song? Because I want us to get past talking about it and I want us to really be about it and not just white people showing up for black people, but I wanted men to show up for women and straight people and cis people to show up for trans people and for queer people. I wanted us all to say, you know what, are we gonna be the change that we wanna see? The Jamaican entrepreneur and owner of quintessential lifestyles, hair salon and boutique. She's also the author of Journey, My Life Behind the Chair. Well, I am most excited to feature Pita Gay McCullough on the Chandria Show. My dear, welcome to the show. <laughs> hey, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. <laughs> of course, it's my pleasure. Okay, let's get down to it now. You were once a little Jamaican girl with big dreams to one day live in America. Tell me about your childhood. <laughs> So I grew up in, you know, in Jamaica, you have this whole island life, a whole island vibe. So being very cultural, having your aunts and uncles around, you know, having Sunday service and dinner and brunches, that is how I grew up. I grew up with a lot of family, a lot of love, and it was so cultured that, yeah, I didn't know that we were poor. I just knew that we had family around and we were always together in one house and it was perfectly normal to me. Until I came to the state. So I, I read about in your bio that you you had big dreams of coming to America when you were a little girl. So what what visions of, of America did you have on television and film and books or you know what imagery did you have at such a young age? We didn't have any of that. We basically you know coming when anyone would come down to visit us from the states was basically they would come with a suitcase full of clothes, right? And the clothes would smell amazing, and then you would get the food. So everything just looks so luxurious, looks so fabulous. So coming to the States was basically to look fabulous. So being on TV, you thought, you, you know, you're gonna be in a limousine and you're gonna be on TV and everybody was a superstar. So that was the image as a little girl. What brought you to the States? Um, when, when mom decided that, you know, things were hard. She was a single mom and she wanted a better opportunity for us. We were living from, like I said, in this big house. So we were living with aunts and uncles. So she basically wanted to give us an opportunity for better schooling and just a better life, meaning that we'd be able to have a car. We having a car was a luxury. We didn't have cars, so we, you know, public transportation. And so she wanted to give us those opportunities. What or who inspired you to be a hairstylist? So, no one really inspired me to be a hairstylist. It's just as a little girl, I always like getting my hair done. And then when I decided to go to college, I basically was like, okay, how am I gonna pay for an apartment? How am I gonna pay for things? So, I just was like, I'm gonna be a shampoo assistant. That's quick, easy money. And I just went to beauty school to, to basically have a certificate. And then my craft kept growing and my clientele started to pick up and I was like, okay, this is easy money. It's not structured. No one to tell me when to clock in and clock out. And that's what my interest started to peak. You're like, okay, I'm in control of my schedule, mm -hmm. you know? And I can make quick, easy money. Going home with $50 tips was my thing. <laughs> I understand. Then from that, from doing hair, then you launched your own business, Quintessential Lifestyle Hair Salon and Boutique. So what do you offer your clientele? Where currently we offer like this ambiance that is like no other, a sisterhood first and foremost. Everyone that walks in the door is like a friend. You, If you don't know me, you, you get to know me. And then we are just, first of all, happy. We are dressed like to the T. So coming in here, it makes you feel good. It elevates your spirit. And then of course the boutique is there. So you want to shop, you want to feel good. You know what I mean? So that's really what quintessential lifestyle offer you. It gives you a whole lifestyle experience, gives you luxury, and it gives you sisterhood. 
Beautiful. And I know that's the type of thing that will make your clientele want to come back over and over your sisterhood. Yes. Those conversations, they build rapport and a relationship with you. And on top of that, great service. And I could shop for fabulous clothes. Like Exactly. <laughs> if that outfit that you might have ordered is too small, which is usually the case, we have that last minute backup plan. Got it. <laughs> Okay, so you wrote a book called Journey, My Life Behind the Chair, which I think is a great play on words because like you just said, you're the sisterhood, you're the confidant, you're all these things. Um, what will readers learn about you in your book? You'll basically learn that I am so faith-filled. That is the number one key that a lot of people don't realize. Like, oh my goodness, this girl have prayer service every morning. She is definitely prayed up to come in to deal with these women so you will learn that about me and you will learn how much faith I have to keep pressing on why I stay positive why I stay encouraged it's because of you know being prayed up so you will definitely learn that along the way despite everything that's going on I dealt with my clients in my chair I never like took my problems to, to work I basically left them home and when I was at work it was I was in work mode and that's how I basically live my life. Almost like a therapist, in a sense. You know? <laughs> a fabulous therapist. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because, of course, that despite of all that I'm going through, I'm going to tell you what to do, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you look absolutely beautiful on the cover of your book. Um, when you see that cover, when you hold it, when you got it done, what do you see when you look at that? Oh my God. So of course I got to get that for you. Right? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Books literally just got here today. Today, these boxes. And um, I'm, I'm happy because I know everybody probably like, okay, is this a backdrop? But the book is literally on the beach because I love the beach. I'm from the island, obviously. So to be fabulously dressed on the beach was perfect. And then, you know, the whole fabulosity of the dress is just speaks volume and it just speaks who I am. So I'm this little person with a big personality and that's what I do when I see this book. I just see this little person with a great personality. And a big story to tell, you know, yes, the yes. inspiration yes. to others. Yes, there's so much packed in that book and so much packed into you, so absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know, what have been some of the hardest challenges um, that you've gone through and, and what do you attribute to your ability to triumph over them? I think the hardest thing, and it still is hard for me, it's still not having my mom. Like, not able to have my mom with my kids, it's the hardest thing. I literally want to cry every day. Um, when I speak to her, mentioning the word mom is emotional for me, period. So not having my mom is the hardest thing for me to overcome. And every Mother's Day, every birthday, every holiday, it's hard. It's hard to deal with not having this woman that you admire, this woman that birthed you. And my kids not having the opportunity to have a grandmother. So that's very hard for me. And, um, but I could overcome when I could FaceTime her, you know what I mean? I have that opportunity to talk to her daily. I have the opportunity to send her some fabulous pieces, you know? Oh, I'm good daughter. <laughs> you know, so when I could send her Uber Eats and send her dinner, those are the little things now that I look forward to. Um, so, but not having her has to be the hardest thing, you know? And hopefully soon. <laughs> And as a survivor of difficult experiences, you know, how do you encourage anyone watching who's feeling hopeless in their own lives right now? Um, it's, it's, it's right now, especially with the pandemic and everyone feeling like hopeless in this, with this country and the state that we are in right now, all I could do is say, you know what, listen to the word, like put something positive on. In my station, I have words of encouragement, encouragement. And every day I basically have to give my, download a word and let it be something that's motivational let it be a song whatever it is download that every day not just download it like reading it but download it and digest it apply it to your life you know and that's really what that's who i am i don't want to just be singing something i want to be doing it so my favorite thing is like you know i can show you better than i could tell you so reading the word and the scriptures, I want to apply it to who I am and to my everyday lifestyle.
Get to know Shelly Shelton. She's an author and divorce recovery coach. After 20 years of marriage, she bravely moved forward into her new chapter. Today, she and I discuss defining a daring life after divorce. Shelly Shelton, welcome to the Shandria Show. How are you? I am fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Now, as a divorce recovery coach, I would love to know what inspired you to use your personal experience to help others. Yeah, so I went through a major, major divorce. Uh, I tell people all the time, I used to be blind and unable to walk. And divorce was 10 times worse than that. Wow. And in essence, I had to bounce back from that. And when I bounced back, I realized I wasn't the only one that was going through this level of pain. And, uh, and so people started watching me and seeing how I was doing this. And so, uh, in essence, I developed the, uh, my own formula for success of how you bounce back after divorce and then started helping and coaching people how you get through this. How do you go through the emotional trauma, the financial drama, and all those moments when you're going to feel like calling your mama. So, um, so yeah, so it, it was definitely a transition. So, present day, what services do you offer your clients? So today what I offer is um, I offer weekly, bi-weekly, and most monthly coaching. Um, so it all depends upon what their needs are. So I do a, a self-discovery session with everyone first, find out exactly what their needs are, where they are in the separation and divorce process. And then from that, determine if we need to talk weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly, and then move, move the process from there. It's an interesting um, career choice. And I love it because I mean, so many people go through divorce and then you're kind of left to pick up the pieces after that divorce. And so I love that you, you know, you have shown an interest in helping people kind of pick themselves up and, and continue on with life. Yeah, thank you so much. I really didn't know this was going to be something that I was going to be doing. Believe me, it's not one of those things when you write your vision board plan and you say, oh, <laughs> I'm going to be a divorce recovery coach. It was not on my board. Right. Um, but I worked with um, E.T., the hip hop preacher, with motivational speaking, and then that led into divorce recovery. Okay, very interesting. So I have a question then. So you were married for 20 years, right? Married for 14, we dated for seven, so okay. together for 21 all Total together. 20 years together. How would you describe your marriage in the end? In the end, I would describe it as um, two roommates that had a lack of communication. Okay. And uh, the marriage piece, the foundation of marriage was gone. Uh, and we basically looked at one another one day and discovered we were, we were basically just roommates. Um, but the love was still there. Uh, so so it, was, it was pretty interesting, but a very painful process. Okay. So it was amicable, mutual, um, and I'm, 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 I read that you launched multiple businesses, including your own staffing agency, and you developed a newfound passion, and you credit your divorce for all of this. Please tell me about that. Oh, yeah. So, in essence, when I went through divorce, I discovered that I was living a life and, and had no idea who I was until the divorce was over, which a lot of people discovered that. Mm -hmm. And when the divorce was over, I realized I needed a new beginning. And I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so I had, in essence, buried my goals to support my marriage and support my husband, which a lot of wives do. And so I took that and turned all of that pain into profit and into a business. So I realized I wanted a new career. And most people did after that as well. So I started my own staffing agency. I had been in town acquisition for over 15 years. And so I started my own staffing agency. After that, I realized most people, when you go through divorce, um, you, your, your place is, does, is not a reflection of who you are. So I started my own interior decorating business. And so I began to just continue to develop businesses after that and just go after every single goal. But I credit going through divorce. If my ex-husband had never left me, I would have never have had the gumption of just going after every single goal. Wow. Well, kudos to you. It's absolutely commendable, you know, the way you took, you know, a, a difficult time in your life and, and you made good with it. So I think that's absolutely amazing. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. 
Um, during what I imagine to be one of your most vulnerable moments in life, um, what did it take though for you to choose your own happiness? Because you could have, I mean, you could have gone a different route. You know, you could have, you could have been the one that needed a, a, a divorce recovery coach. You know, in a sense, you know, what is that? What is that that you have? What is that in you? You know, yeah. that resilience, that strength. Where does that come from? It's that drive. It's the, I call it that beast mode drive. You have to want to have um, that idea, that dream of living your best life. And I, when I was going through divorce, I was like, my God, like, Lord, I know you will give me the desires of my heart because that's what God's word says. He will give you the desires of your heart. And so I decided that I wanted to live my happiest life. And to do that, I needed to give up on some, some things that were no longer important. So it took a lot of sacrifice a lot of energy, but a lot of drive. So you have to be passionate about what it is that you want to do. And then look now, you're in a prime example to others. You're an inspiration to others and you're helping others too. I think that's amazing. <laughs> um, what, while divorce isn't always the first option when couples face problems, what advice do you have for anyone watching that may be struggling in a toxic, unhappy, or lifeless marriage? Yeah, the first thing that I would tell people to do is you need a marriage counselor. You need a third party or, or a coach to help you through. A great majority of the time, marriages can be saved, but you need to learn how to communicate. When you've gotten to that lifeless part, like you said in your question, you need someone to help you figure things out. When you first started that relationship, it wasn't lifeless. So how do you now bounce back if you want to save your marriage? But I, the first step is to get a marriage counselor or get a coach or a therapist to be that third party mediator. That's great advice to get someone else involved, which I get it. This could be a very private you know, ordeal. So you want to keep it to yourself, but that's not advisable. Get to know the Natalia Megan hair and beauty product line. Founded in 2018, the company is a black female owned and operated business based in Washington, DC. The cosmetic line carries cruelty-free, hydrating, luxury matte lipsticks, lip glosses, and 3D mink faux voluminous lashes, all under $10. Celebrities such as Jennifer Hudson, Mariah Carey, Naturi Naughton, KJ Smith, Juju, and Zanique have all been spotted wearing the Natalia Megan hair and beauty brand. The products are sold online at www.nataliabeauty.com. Get to know Culture Greetings. They are a woman-led and black-owned greeting card company that just launched a new Princess Store integration partnership with Walgreens. Founded in 2018, Culture Greetings offers more than 2,000 greeting cards featuring imagery centered around and elevating the black and brown community's voices. Card options span all mainstream and cultural holidays and occasions, life milestones, social justice, LGBTQ+, and phone card templates for customized personal greetings. Learn more online at www.culturegreetings.com. Shut up, 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 shut up